Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank our Cracker Jack AV folks for being here to um, record an important moment for Mills College. So welcome to all of you for this year's Russell Women in Science Lecture. This is um, 10 years since we started this, this lecture, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you've taken time to join us today. I want to thank everyone who's here, um, our students, our faculty, our staff. I want to thank the family and friends who are joining us today. Um, it's a busy time for everybody. Uh, we're back out of um, the Zoom rooms that we've been in, at least to a, to a significant extent, and I'm grateful to see people back here on campus, on, on the Mills College campus here in the Student Union. I also want to welcome Dr. Gilda Barabino um, to our campus. I'm grateful that she was able to spend the day with uh, some of our students and faculty, and that she can join us in person this year as our Russell Women in Science lecturer. Gilda is a powerful and appropriate speaker for Mills to add to the distinguished list of luminaries who have joined us on our campus as part of the Russell Women in Science lecture over the years. Gilda doesn't know this, but one of her chosen fields, biomedical engineering, is especially close to my own heart. I considered it as a second major when I was an undergraduate, but I couldn't quite manage all the extra classes. Um, so I stuck with a single engineering major, and I was always fascinated by medical devices and by the interplay between engineered devices that people made and the engineering of the human body. I also had a chance to witness Dr. Barabino in action when we both were part of a National Academy's study panel on sexual harassment in the sciences, engineering, and medicine. She proved a force among a group of high-powered professionals and earned the respect and admiration of the staff and the members of that panel. I want to thank Beth Coakley, Associate Provost and uh, uh, Professor of Chemistry here at Mills College, as the coordinator of this year's lecture. She organized all the various aspects of, of this, sessions with students, faculty, um, our events here, and worked with Kim Baker in the Office of Institutional Advancement to organize this. I'm grateful for, for all of the folks in our, our um, sort of thinly staffed Office of Institutional Advancement who have stepped up to help us with this event this year. And now I'm humbled by the chance to briefly introduce Chris Russell, who in turn will introduce Dr. Barabino. The Russell Lectureship has played a crucial role over the years in providing Mills College students firsthand, face-to-face -face insight into the potential avenues they might face for leadership throughout the sciences. They've learned more about what careers might look like across the sciences and the many forms that leadership can take. This lectureship and many other activities on our campus related to women's leadership in science have been possible because of Chris Russell's visionary commitment to supporting our STEM programs and promoting women's leadership in science and beyond. So in this brief intro, I'll just give you a glimpse into the many fields that she's chosen to engage with and the impact that she's had. An award-winning journalist who's written about science, health, and the environment for more than four decades, Chris is among the most distinguished alumni of Mills College. From the class of 1971, she studied biology at Mills during another tumultuous period of Mills College's history, the late 1960s and into the 1970s. She later served, she soon after served on our board actually, and then she later served longer, nearly two decades, on the Mills College Board of Trustees. Now a senior fellow in the Environment and Natural Resources Program at the Harvard Kennedy School, she also teaches public policy there. She was a national science reporter for the Washington Post, a panelist for public broadcasting shows, a past president of the National Association of Science Writers and the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. Her research has focused on science writing and how to improve news coverage of controversial science policy issues. I'll just pause for a moment there and say, if we weren't convinced that we needed better understanding of how to promote useful news coverage of controversial science issues, the um, global pandemic that we're starting to come out of now is a great example of how prescient her work has been and how much we continue to need that. So the Russell Women in Science Lecture debuted at Mills College in 2012. Its goal is to introduce Mills students and the general public to outstanding women leaders in the sciences. It features an annual lecture by a prominent scientist who spends the day collaborating with Mills faculty and students on scientific issues um, and career opportunities. 
The program emphasizes the breadth of opportunities available as we're aware that we need the ideas and the energy of our new students and their futures to help us change the direction of many of the, the biggest challenges that we face today. I'm honored to welcome Christine Russell, class of 1971 Mills College to the podium to introduce our distinguished guest speaker. Thank you so much, President Hillman, and welcome to all of you in the audience. It's great to see students, faculty, friends, and people who may have just made their way onto the Mills campus and saw this gathering taking place in this great historic uh, student union building. It's, I also wanted to thank Beth Coakley and Kim Baker for all of their work on getting this lecture and lectureship. What's wonderful about it is it's not just a, a one-off lecture, but we've had the opportunity to spend the day with Dr. Gilda A. Barabino, and she has really gotten to know a number of our students in multiple meetings today, and, and that's an important part of this uh, experience. So it's my pleasure to introduce her. She was actually, she's two years late, uh, she was supposed to be our speaker in April of 2020. We were all ready to go, and then I think we all know what happened in mid-March of 2020. So it's amazing that we're able to get her back on campus two years later, kind of replaying the tape. A lot has happened, and actually a lot has happened in her life as well. Her career took another turn right around the time uh, of the COVID pandemic, and she became the president of Olin College of Engineering in Needham, Massachusetts, and she's also a professor of biomedical and chemical engineering there. Uh, and on May 5th, even though she's been working on campus as president since 2020, she is finally going to be inaugurated on May 5th uh, in person, just as we're delighted to be having this in-person lecture today. Throughout her career as a biomedical engineer, Dr. Barabino has been a passionate advocate for reducing barriers in engineering for women and underrepresented students of color. She was actually the first black woman to earn a PhD at Rice University, and only the fifth black woman in the country to earn a doctorate in the field. So history is made by the individuals who come out and become leaders. She has been a noted researcher in sickle cell disease, cellular and tissue engineering, and race, ethnicity, and gender in science and engineering. Prior to becoming president of Olin College, Dr. Barabino served as dean of the Grove School of Engineering at the College City College of New York. So she's come back. Uh, she had taught also at Georgia Tech and when another connection here, she was at Northeastern University for 18 years. So she's circled her career back to the Boston area, and we're really glad that we could convince her to come back two years later. Uh, she recently became president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the world's largest interdisciplinary scientific society. And it's really a great honor and privilege that uh, it's a meeting that I attend every year when possible. Uh, there, it's been virtual for the last couple of years too. So she is there in a transition period and hopefully she will be able to speak in person at next year's meeting in Washington, DC. Uh, she's also an active member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine and again chairs an important committee, the National Academies Committee on Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Her many honors include the American Institute of Chemical Engineers Award for Service to Society in 2019. Now we've had a couple of years gap, so she is our seventh uh, Women in Science lecturer and she follows in a great tradition and is a pathfinder that we really uh, admire in her leadership throughout science. So she will speak to us today on an important topic, engineering for societal impact. 
And we should note that engineering has been one of the toughest fields for women to succeed in. So she's doubly uh, challenged in terms of how she got started and became a leader in this field. So we're gonna hear more about engineering and its societal impact. So thank you so much for being here today. Really, really, and for the audience as well. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to start by saying thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that wonderful, kind introduction. I can't tell you how honored I am to be here, to be part of the Russell uh, Lecture Series for Women in Science. I want to say thank you to President Hillman and thank you to Professor Coakley for the warm reception. And thank you for all, all of you for being here and for the very warm reception that I've received from Mills College. I feel like I have new friends for life here. I want to talk to you today about engineering for societal impact, and I'm going to tell you about it through my own career by way of example. So I'm going to start out a bit. Let's see if I can get to the next slide here. From my perspective, I'm telling you this through my lens as a black woman academic, from an intersectional lens that includes both uh, race, ethnicity, and gender, through the idea and concepts of conceptual frameworks that I've learned over time, including from reports in the literature and some of my own work. So those are the kinds of lenses that I'm looking through and the perspective that I'll use for what I'll share with you today. So I wanted to start out telling you a little bit about my own research, some of which was uh, looking at sickle cell disease. And the way I got started investigating sickle cell disease in particular, I thought about engineering as a way to look at solving problems in medicine. I also was very much interested in ways that I might give back to my own community. Sickle cell disease disproportionately impacts African Americans. So this idea to be able to investigate a disease, combine engineering skills in a medical application was very much part of the driver. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about sickle cell disease and why uh, it was important to me to study. So, Living with sickle cell disease is very uh, complicated and debilitating in many ways. There's about 100,000 in the United States who suffer with sickle cell disease, and it's a genetic blood disorder, very debilitating in terms of chronic pain and organ damage, economic burden. There's a lot of poverty uh, associated with the disease in terms of people who who have the disease and, and background and so on. And also this concept of looking at sickle cell disease at the intersection of race, health, and politics. So those who are living with the disease not only have the burden of the disease, but also have the burden of racism, particularly how, how it plays out in our country. So I was actually interested and how could I understand more about the disease and contribute as, a, as an engineer? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the sickle cell disease, its global nature, and then get to the point of studying it as an engineer. It is global. As you can see from this map, it looks at the number of newborns with sickle cell anemia uh, in 2015. The darker areas are the higher areas of incidence, and you'll see a heavy concentration in the uh, equatorial uh, regions, and I'll tell you why. It was thought, it is thought that sickle cell as a, a disease, as a genetic mutation, the mutation evolved as a protection against malaria so that the malarial parasite actually was not able to survive on sickle blood. So though the individuals with the sickle hemoglobin might have been protected against malaria, they were much more prone to death, high uh, 
death expectancy because of the complications of the disease. And you'll see these heavy concentrations in areas of Africa and in India in particular. And it is global, as I mentioned. And the investigations in terms of researchers and those who are treating the disease uh, is an international population as well. So it's shown here in this picture is the uh, National Sickle Cell Disease Center in Kotonu, uh, Republic of Benin. I had the good fortune to visit there uh, in 2009 with a group of international investigators. And the occasion that we were there for was the grand opening of the Sickle Cell Center there in Benin. But I want to show you this picture again. If you look in the middle there, the, that building is the, cent is the center that, uh, that they were using at the time. It is not necessarily the best equipped in terms of uh, facilities and resources. And many of the people who were coming there were coming from villages. And oftentimes, by the time they brought their newborns uh, and were getting treatment, they might not have survived because they didn't know actually that they were carriers or actually, uh, you know, they had sickle cell disease. So this idea of having a more international attention and having a new center and bringing investigators from across the world to study both ways of investigating and conducting research but also ways of treatment was really important. So the meeting that I was at brought in investigators from across the world, as I mentioned, and we talked about what were some of the new strategies and um, uh, ways of, that we could do research and treatment. What I liked about this particular meeting, we had the opportunity to meet families and mothers who talked about their experiences of taking care of their, their children with the disease and so on. And part of why I'm saying that, and you'll hear more later in the talk, about how important it is for us to understand those that we are serving, particularly when it's underserved. So I say a little bit more about the disease. Many of you maybe have heard a lot about sickle cell disease, and you may have even learned about it in a biochemistry course or a biology course. It comes, I said it's a genetic disease, but it's a, a mutation where a single amino acid substitution in the beta chain of a hemoglobin molecule causes a change in how the hemoglobin molecules actually um, interact. So normally, in a normal red blood cell, you have hemoglobin molecules that are distributed in an aqueous solution, and so they can actually move freely within the red blood cell. The red blood cell has this biconcave shape and it's uh, basically surrounding hemoglobin molecules in this aqueous solution and it's floppy. So a red cell can fold over on itself and pass through vessels, even vessels that have a smaller diameter. But the sickle cell mutation actually causes these hemoglobin molecules to stick together in deoxygenated conditions. So when those molecules stick together, they actually form these stiff fibers that cause the cells to become misshapen and stiff and they don't pass through the circulation well. When your cells don't, your red cells don't pass through your circulation well, the vessels can become blocked, oxygen doesn't get delivered to the tissues appropriately, and the way it's experienced is intense pain and it also can cause tissue damage and organ damage. So the experiments that I'm gonna share with you, there were many that we conducted, but I'm gonna share with you a little bit of some of the more recent data that we looked at where we were looking at bone involvement specifically in sickle cell disease. And if you can imagine, we might need models to look at um, in terms of what's happening in the human body. It's not like you can actually just go to an individual living with a disease and say, I wanna examine your bone. So what we have is animal models. We have sickle mice. See, these are transgenic mice that are genetically manipulated to express human hemoglobin. And so they were manipulated so that they could express the sickle uh, hemoglobin. And we looked at these transgenic mice for at 10 weeks and 21 weeks to mimic youth and adults who would have sickle cell disease. That was the point 
We looked at femurs, the, the, the femurs uh, in the mice, and it turns out that the femur in a mouse model actually is a good indicator of behavior of bone uh, for humans. We looked at these femurs and we were um, examining the properties. We were trying to understand the microarchitecture and understand those properties of the bone. So I'm just going to sh share a couple of the results that we had. So we were doing uh, micro CT sections where we were imaging and looking at the femoral um, trabecular bone. And what you see here for 10 weeks and 21 weeks, the AA is normal, the AS is trait, so that's a carrier. So they don't have homozygous sickle disease, but they are carriers. And the SS is the full-blown sickle cell. So these are the transgenic mice. And what you see here for this trabecular bone, at 10 weeks, it looks relatively the same, but at 21 weeks, with the aging, not only do you have the kind of deterioration that comes with aging, for sickle, you see much more dramatic deterioration. And that's because of the, the complications of the disease and the problems with the, the blood flow. And then when we looked in the cortical region of the bone, we saw the same thing. So this is a heat map that actually shows you, uh, based on color, the thickness. So the red is the thickest, and as you move in the color scheme, the green is gonna be thinner. And you see it's much thinner for the sickle bone. So in summary of these studies, what we saw was that with age, the bone deterioration is much more severe for sickle. So this is, again was a mouse model, but this would translates for what you might see for sickle behavior for an individual a human living with a disease. That's just to give you an example of research of an engineer working on a medical problem and how that engineering could be used to better understand the conditions of the disease. And for the National Academies, I was able to participate in a study, a consensus study, where we were looking at the future of sickle cell disease in terms of research and patient care. And the results of this study was published in this report addressing sickle cell disease, and we looked at a strategic plan and a blueprint for the future. So now I actually would like to shift gears a bit. Gave you an example of impact through research, and I want to talk to you about some examples about educating in science and engineering. And to do that, let me tell you a little bit about what I think is the current state of science and engineering. I told you I was going to talk a bit about my perspective from my own lived experience. I'm also going to talk to you about some of what I felt very committed to throughout my career, and that was the absence of women and those from historically underrepresented groups in these fields. So that's like really driving a lot of what I have done in my career, but it's also driving a lot of what I want to share with you today. So consider that the careers of women and, and those from uh, racially minoritized groups have been stunted in, in many ways. And consider also that we have a dearth of women leaders and that in many ways there's some invisibility of the, those who have been traditionally excluded and their contributions. But I also think there's some invisibility around practices and behaviors that contribute to that. Again, about the state of where we stand. This is a recent study. It was called uh, the Women's Power Gap at Elite Universities. This was from a survey. They, they surveyed 130 elite uh, universities across the country. And one of the things that they reported is that even though women made up 55% of the PhD earners, 22% of the presidents. And for women of color, it was 19% of the PhD earners in 5% of the presidents. And that women make up 39% of academic deans and 38% of provosts. So one of the things that we look at is what is the progression to the presidency. Another thing they reported in their study was that since 2020, black male presidents had doubled, but we did not see similar gains for uh, women. And now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about 
leading change? Because I think it's important we understand the landscape that, they're, that we're in. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to affect change, particularly as leaders and women leaders in particular? I'm going to share with you one of my favorite quotes from James Baldwin. And he said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And speaking of change, Angela Davis, she said, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. And another change agent, Audre Lorde, from a litany for survival, she wrote, when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it's better to speak, remembering we were not meant to survive. And many times, those who are in environments that they have been excluded from are afraid to speak. And I think there's a, an important lesson to be learned about speaking up. And I'll share with you another uh, quote from Audre Lorde around bravery. But I'll tell you one thing about Audre Lorde that I found that was interesting. Later in life, she renamed herself Gamba Adisa. And it means she who makes her meaning known. And she spoke about bravery in my mind when she said, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. I think you might get a sense that I'm not afraid. And so one of the things that I think has been really important about speaking up and being able to try to affect change is getting in good trouble. And I'm going to quote John Lewis. I had the good fortune of meeting him when he was a, a commencement speaker and receiving an honorary degree at City College of New York. And here we were having breakfast. He was so inspirational. And this idea of creating trouble and getting in good trouble, I love that. And I encourage all of us to think about that. So I'm going to tell you about some of the good trouble I've gotten into. So one thing that I think is really important is thinking about counter narratives. And by counter narratives, I mean truth telling and giving stories, telling and sharing our experiences. Sometimes they're counter to the narratives that you typically hear. So one that I, I wrote about was in this book, Counter Narratives from Women of Color Academics. It was a project where everyone who contributed was asked to speak about and write about something that they had done in their career that was brave. And in my chapter, I talked about um, some of the things that I had done that were a bit brave that maybe in certain cir circumstances could have kept me from getting tenure. Uh, but I did it anyway. And so I talked about what looks like bravery in the academy, reflections of an African-American woman engineer. In another case, I worked on a project where we, we were writing about mentoring diverse leaders. And in this case, I had a co-author. One of my co-authors was a former student of mine. And we talked about the mentoring relationship. And we titled our chapter, Moving Beyond the Heroic Journey Myth. And what we were talking about is this idea of oftentimes, particularly in science settings, it's like the mentor is seen as this heroic savior that's going to come in and save. And we talked about, no, how about a mentoring-mentee relationship that's mutually beneficial, that you're learning from one another, and it's mutually empowering? And we talked about the kind of mentoring that we thought should happen in inclusive environments, regardless of whether it was a technical environment or not, and the importance of being able to share. And another project I worked on with a, a social science collaborator, collaborator, Cheryl Lagon, and we talked about socialization. How do you socialize into a particular field? How do you help people know the unspoken ru rules and ways of doing in that profession? And this one we titled Socializing African American Female Engineers into Academic Careers, the case of the Cross-Disciplinary Initiative for Minority Women Faculty. What our cross-disciplinary initiative was, was this idea that we would have a research data-driven project 
that at the same time was supporting the career development of women of color in the academy. So not only did we conduct research with a cohort, we had a cohort of 20, and we followed their careers over three years. During that whole three-year period, we had opportunities for them to come together, form community, network. And some of the lessons learned would not surprise you. The importance of community building, networking, having a cohort to work with, understanding one another, sharing stories. And we also talked about the importance of how do you develop your career for not just um, surviving, but thriving. So now I'm gonna change gears a little bit and tell you a little bit about what I think is important around centering diversity, equity, and inclusion in any environments that we find ourselves in. And here I think it's very important for us to move beyond talking to walking, like taking that action. I quote here some of the uh, work that was shared in the book that was called from Equity Talk to Equity Walk by McNair and her colleagues. And some of the things they talked about in this, this uh, book that I think is important for all of us is this idea of being committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and building equity-minded cultures, this ability to communicate and have tools for uh, advancing equity, aligning strategies, building capacity. It's also important for us to understand ourselves, hold a mirror to ourselves and see how we're doing. Collect and analyze the data and share it and hold ourselves accountable. I think it's important for us to do what I call breaking the mold. And in that case, I'm talking about things like how do we recognize those who don't necessarily get recognized for the work that they do and their contribution? How do we restructure our environments? And I mean having our environments that are supportive and inclusive. And that's everything from being able to go into an environment and see someone who looks like you, but it also goes beyond representation so that you feel connected to the environment. Cultural competence is important. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to understand cultures, understand the cultures that people bring, understand people's whole selves and their identities, so not just where we come from, but where others come from, and being willing to understand and support one another. And lived experiences, I think, are really important for us to understand. We all see the world through our own lived experiences, but it's important for us to understand that, how that impacts what we see and do, but also how it impacts what others see and do as well. I think it's also important for us to think about the opportunities that people have or don't have. I don't think we have a shortage of talent in this country at all, but what I do think we have problems with is matching the opportunities in the talent. And I'll say over and over again how important it is to create a sense of belonging. Human nature, we all want to belong. So I'll share with you this one quote from this Haas Institute of Fair and Inclusive Society, which I think is a good way of looking at belonging. That belonging or being fully human means more than having access. It means having a meaningful voice and being afforded the opportunity to participate in the design of social and cultural structures. Belonging entails being respected at a basic level and includes the right to both contribute and to make demands upon society and political institutions. So when we look for a sense of belonging, it is the idea that you feel a part of the place, but that you're valued and your contributions are valued as well. And lastly, uh, in belonging and sharing another quote with you is from Bell Hooks. She wrote a lot about belonging. One of her books is specifically about belonging. And one of the things she said in her writing was that we can restore hope in a world that transcends race by building communities where self-esteem comes not from feeling superior to any group, but from one's relationship to the land, to the people, to the place, wherever that may be. And in her case, she grew up in a rural area, and she talks a lot about that connection to place and how she felt that connection to 
place in the land wherever she was. So those are some things for us to think about as well. And now I want to start moving towards the end of the presentation to talk about impact. Because it's not just good enough to have good intentions. It's like, what do we do? And what's the impact of what we've done? And, and moving towards impact, because I talked about centering diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now I'm going to talk about centering impact. I'm going to give you some examples from engineering. So some, this concept of impact-centered engineering, I think, has a lot to do with how we use engineering for good, for public good. And I'll give you a couple examples from Olin. So one of them is a course that's titled Engineering for Humanity. This course is actually led by an anthropologist. Most of our classes are team taught, and Olin is interdisciplinary, no departments. So everyone works across the different disciplines. So it's not unusual to have a psychology professor working with an engineering professor, a material scientist working with a historian. In this particular class, I like it a lot, the students are working directly with senior citizens. So there, there's a, a assisted living facility that's not far from the campus. The students go to that facility. They work directly with the people who are living there. And they work with them and talk to them about what are some things that we could do and design for you that might make your life better, make it better like on a day-to-day -day basis. So this idea of user-centered oriented design having them involved in the design is fantastic. I can't tell you how excited the students are working directly with the individuals who are in this stage of life where they really just say, sure, here's, here's my latest issue. One of the designs, uh, a woman had um, an oxygen carrier that was heavy. They came up with a, a, a more lightweight version of the oxygen tank and a backpack for it. And she said it made her uh, mobility and, and ability to, to go out and do things so much better. So here's another example of a course. This one's called Affordable Design and Entrepreneurship. It is led by engineers, but also those who are, are working in social sciences. It is specifically designed to be global specifically designed for affordability. It's back. <laughs> so, um, and so the problems that they look at are problems where you need low cost solutions to be more resourceful in these particular areas. And if you want to have a challenge for design, try to make it low cost. And it's you have to be even more creative. So what I like about this course is the students have an opportunity to design, to have social entrepreneurship. They also have a chance to mix design and entrepreneurship skills with technical skills and models, and importantly, for social ventures for public good. So I think you get this sense of engineering and engineering for everyone. And what we think about when we say things like that is like, how do you use engineering in ways that the field is accessible so anyone feels like they can be an engineer, what engineers look like, but importantly, what we do with engineering and who's it serving. And you heard from Chris that I have become the president of AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science. And one of the nice things about being president is that you get to set the theme for the next annual meeting. This is my theme, <laughs> Science for Humanity. I'm so excited about that theme and what we could do with that and reaching those, everyone. And I see a bit of a scientist in everyone. This is really kind of neat, <laughs> like <laughs> special effects. Um, and so now I'm going to round out by telling you a little bit about what I think we need to do to ensure impact. Because it's not good enough to have the impact, but we need to do some things around making sure that we sustain it. 
I'm going to share with you some new things that I've been talking about lately because I believe that we've had situations where we talk a lot about how do we make progress, but yet progress has been pretty stagnant in terms of increasing the numbers of women or those from traditionally excluded groups in spite of lots of interventions, in spite of investments. So that what I think is missing is looking at some of the things that are behaviors and practices that might be invisible, but they are uh, problematic nonetheless. So I want to talk to you about some of the things that I, are, I believe are important about making visible the invisible. So let's talk about some visibility conditions. So what do we mean about visibility? So one way Settles and some of her colleagues have talked about visibility is the extent to which an individual is fully regarded and recognized by others. And of course, invisibility is not being seen or recognized. But there's also this concept of hypervisibility. And hypervisibility comes about, well, so think about me, the black woman. I might be hypervisible in some situations, one only, but you can be hypervisible and invisible at the same time. And that hypervisibility often brings with this additional scrutiny that's based on perceived difference. So I want to share with you this sense of uh, thinking about invisibility from black literature. So the black experience, there are many cases where people can be in situations and feel invisible. And I think it was captured very well in black literature in Ralph Ellison's novel, Invisible Man. And in that novel, the protagonist says at one point, I'm invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. So that invisibility, and so uh, invisible, Man was actually a metaphor for that type of invisibility. And I posit that if you are a woman of color, you may even have what we talk about as intersectional invisibility. And one writer, Harley, speaks of the metaphorical maid of the academy. And what she talked about is how a black woman in the academy could be invisible in many ways and stereotypically seen as someone who's supposed to serve. And that's part of what she meant by the maid of the academy. But there's also this concept of being an outsider within. So that you're, you're in as a member of the academy, but because you're not part of the majority or the normalized grouping, it's, you're seen as an outsider. So this hypervisibility and invisibility, it's a conundrum. And some of the ways that plays out is being seen when there's some work to be done. Like, oh, you could be a twofer. I need a woman and I need a minority on my committee. So I see you. But now it's time for recognition. Oh, who are you? I don't know you. So that, that, that's a conundrum. So that's what we mean by the hypervisibility and invisibility. Another practice that I think that we need to make more visible that tends to be invisible is what we call gatekeeping. Now scientists and engineers can be gatekeepers themselves. Even as professors, think about it, we play a role in who gets in, who gets recruited, who's retained, so that level of gatekeeping. There's also gatekeeping that comes with students, I know you know what I'm talking about, weed out courses. Like, I'm like, why do we need a weed out course? If you took me in, I, that says I could do it, but we have that level of gatekeeping that happens. We also have things that could be as subtle as making eye contact or not, or being encouraged or not, or someone saying to you, you know what, maybe you should change your major. Um, that's gatekeeping. And there's another form of gatekeeping that happens that I learned this term in the literature. It's referred to, it's referred to as epistemic exclusion. What that means is that you could be excluded because your area of expertise is something that is not considered important. So maybe you're studying under represented or excluded groups, and the majority or the group in power thinks that's not important to us. 
that's epistemic exclusion. Also, sometimes you may be excluded simply because who you are. You're not a member of the in-group. That is also considered epistemic exclusion. I can give you an example that I had in my own career. I was in a, a, a case where they were, they were looking at some new opportunities, some seed grants to get some new funding in a new area. The seed grant was exactly in my research area, exactly in my research area, and my colleagues didn't include me. So I asked them, so why didn't you include me in this opportunity? And they said, oh, Gilda, you still do research? I thought you just did diversity work. I'm like, seriously? So <laughs> these things ha happen, <laughs> and I think it's really important for us to pay attention to those things and how they happen so that we can be intentional about calling it out when we see it. Another thing that's important that I think is invisible that we need to call attention to is what I'm calling invisible work and cultural taxation. That's kind of what I was referring to when I said that you could be hyper-visible and invisible at the same time. So there's work that we often expect people to do, especially if they're from a, a, a group that's underserved or underrepresented. So we may say to women, um, make sure you you do extra mentoring here or do outreach or a person of color. Like it's your job to make sure that you're taking care of the students of color. But we don't ask other people who are not from the same background to necessarily take on that work. That's called service work. In the literature, some people even refer to that as a third shift. And because oftentimes we tie it to those who might share a particular cultural background, it's considered a cultural taxation. So why are we taxing others to carry out additional service burden that we don't ask everyone to do? And frankly, I believe strongly that when we think about serving our institutions and our organizations around diversity, equity, inclusion, excellence, it should be everyone's responsibility and it should be shared. And another concept that I'll talk about is what I call the invisible hand. And what I mean by the invisible hand, I mean when someone taps someone on the shoulder, it's like, your turn. Or like, let me open that door for you. Or let me guide you this way, that, that kind of socialization, like, here's what you don't know, but I'm gonna make sure you know it. Well, here's the problem with that. What happens is those who are empowered or in the in-group tend to just naturally do it for one another and don't even realize that others who are not in that situation are not getting that. So that's what I refer to as the invisible hand. And the reason why I demonstrated this way in this illustration, I'm trying to show on purpose how someone's getting that tapping and someone else may not. I have an example for that as well. I was in a leadership workshop once and one of the speakers was a majority man administrator at the time, he was a, a senior vice provost. And he says, now, this was supposed to be helping us learn how to be leaders. And he says, almost bragging, I have never applied for any of the administrative roles I've had. I was just picked, you know? And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> like, you were just picked based on what? And so what stood out to me was, that is an invisible hand. And I don't think for a second he understood how he might have had an extra advantage that others might not have. And what I think would be nice is if everyone had a hand. And the reason why I wrote it this way with the in and parenthetically is because how about we just all get a hand? and that there's no need for these invisible hands, that everyone is getting this opportunity to be lifted up, that we lift and we match opportunity with talent. So that's what I wanted to illustrate there. And I'm gonna leave you with one last quote. I think the, word, the work ahead of us, it's hard, it's challenging, but it's all doable. And there's so much that we need to celebrate and move forward as we think about the future. But when it's tough, sometimes we need a little levity. And I personally believe in humor. 
And I, Langston Hughes is one of my favorite authors. I started reading him when I was in high school and just couldn't get enough of him because he was able to take really difficult, challenging situations and find the humor in it. And sometimes, you know, like you say, things like I'm laughing to keep from crying. There's some truth to that. So what he said about humor was humor is laughing at what you haven't got when you ought to have it. I can't tell you how many times I've laughed about not having what I should have, but I do feel like we are in challenging times, but the future really is bright for all of us, and it's what we make of it. So I want to leave you with that, and I want to thank you so much for your attention, and I hope you'll engage in a little discussion in the time that we have left. Thank you so very much. Absolutely, I'd love to take some questions. Now you have a chance to think of the brilliant questions you want to ask Dr. Farabino. I actually um, want to encourage you to ask whatever question you might have, regardless of how well evolved you think it might be. I have to say, that kind of hand that you just talked about is exactly what we need to make sure we can actually solve the problems that we've left um, the rest of us to figure out. Uh, and, uh, and I mean that for our students, um, honestly, most profoundly. So. Um, comments or questions uh, for Dr. Barabino, this year's Russell Women in Science lecture. Do you mind running? Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Dr. Barabino. That was an excellent lecture. Um, and you. I think that the, um, the example of the uh, invisible, invisible hand is something that you know, really resonates with me and reminds me of um, when I hear about how, like, um, you know, in a room full of powerful men and women, when one woman speaks, others would try to elevate uh, the other woman that just spoke by kind of um, uh, reiterating what they just said. And, and I was just wondering if you could give some more concrete examples of how we can lend this, like, visible or invisible hand to our peers, our colleagues, and most importantly, our students. Oh, sure. That was actually a great example because women talk all the time about saying something and not being heard and it's like, wait, I just said that? And then all of a sudden it's heard by somebody else. But I think in general, I think we need to be able to, and willing to call out what we see because oftentimes we're silent. That's why I talked about like not being afraid to speak because the more the silence is there, the harder it is for the change to happen. Um, but here's some more concrete things. I think it's incumbent upon leaders when they have an opportunity to say something and to lead by example. So the kinds of uh, behaviors that you want others to mimic. Uh, so in environments that we find ourselves in, be it a laboratory or a classroom setting, people watch what we do. People watch who we talk to and how we interact. And I think a lot of times it is as basic as true. Treat others how you want to be treated. Oftentimes we think like, what's the big magic thing? Like what's, what's the program we need to create? And like, how about you just be like you should be to another human being? Like, how about we just go back to basics? I remember when I started um, at Rice, <laughs> As, as the first African-American that they had admitted into that particular program. And one of the faculty members said, I don't know what to say to you, Gil. I don't know how to interact with you. I'm like, how do you interact with everybody else? And like, aren't we here to learn science? Like, could, could you talk to me about science? And like, it's really not that hard. And I think we put barriers up that are not necessary. Um, I also think that we should think about like structures, rules and practices and how do we use them? Are we using them equitably? Um, because sometimes it's, it's like the rules are there 
And there's nothing wrong with the rule, it's that they're not used in an equitable fashion. So I ask people to do things like just audit, just step back and look at how you're conducting your class or how we are promoting. Just that kind of self-auditing all the time actually does make a difference. And looking out for others. So one of the things that I, I've done throughout my career, and it's really not that hard for us to do, is really to speak up for someone else. Because sometimes you find it hard to speak up for yourself, but you don't have a hard time speaking up for someone else. So that's one way of approaching it. Like, it's not about me, but you know what? It's not fair what's going on over there. And many times it's, it's not just about you, but it's not happening in a fair way for many people. And when you see one actually stand up for something, others feel stronger and able to do it. And lastly, I'll say that sometimes it feels scary, but just try it. And it works, or, or you know, maybe the next time you say, well, that what didn't go so well, but I'll try it again. Because each time you do it, you get stronger at it. And then you'll find others who can um, join you, and you'll be strengthened that way as well. Hi, um, I was Hi. wondering if you would maybe be interested in elaborating upon or discussing how a lot of these um, gatekeep adjacent concepts relate to um, published papers and peer reviewed literature um, and that really deeply entrenched system of invisible hands and you know in groups and out groups within scientific publishing and how deeply that affects you know, acad academia as a whole. Yes, so we have structures in place. We have review processes. We have review processes at every level from trying to get something published to trying to get a, a grant funded and so on. So when you think about these structures, part of the issue is around representation. So if you have a group of editors who are the ones who get to say what gets in and what's not getting in. Reviewers, if reviewers have biases and no one's even pointing out these biases. So there are a couple things I think is important because it, it happens a lot. So one I think is to understand what is the structure, what are the processes and understand how that works, who gets in and then figure out how to disrupt that. So one of the things that, that I learned early on in my career was like, okay, wait, there's, <laughs> there's this, they're the editors, and then the editors assign the reviews, <laughs> like who are the reviewers? And then I learned things like, there's some people who know the editors and the reviewers, and they call them up. And they say, hey, I got this paper coming in. There were so many things that I didn't even know about the process. And then even after I knew, I'm like, wait, I don't know those people. And even if I knew them, I don't know if I feel comfortable enough to say, hey, I'm calling you about my paper. So I think it's important for us to understand what the structures are. And I think it's important for those who um, have responsibility for care, like the oversight and the um, implementation to, to do again those audits, like are we being fair? Do we have, um, ways that we look at biases? Do we look at who gets to be the editors and the reviewers, like how they're selected? I will tell you that there are some changes that are starting to occur because people are now questioning the, these structures and these processes that are set up and asking for more diversity amongst reviewers. They're asking for more um, transparency around the processes. So, so that, that's some of what it happens in science. And the reason why we need to understand it and challenge some of the structures when they're not being fair, because there's so many things that our careers depend on. So if you think about the way the structures are now and how we promote in advance, how many papers do you have? Where were they published? How many grants? So the other thing that I think is really important is that we look at our, our structures and our systems and what criteria that we are holding ourselves to. 
who says you need 50 papers? Why aren't 10 okay? Like, what, who, who made those rules up? So I think we need to question some of the rules. And I, I talk about impact because I think it's, who cares about the numbers? Is it impactful? Was it important? Like, what did it do? So I, asking those kinds of questions as you're asking and have more of us ask those questions and then ask people to be accountable with those systems, I think will start to make a difference. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say you can really tell it's a great talk when you hear, you're at the end of it and you think, God, why didn't somebody say it like that before, you know? <laughs> I thought it was really great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I went to graduate school at MIT and then I did a postdoc at Berkeley. And when I was a graduate student at MIT, there were a lot of problems with women graduate students um, and not being encouraged to continue, et cetera. And I remember when I got to be a postdoc at Berkeley, I remember thinking, oh, I just can't wait for these guys, my compatriots, to become, to get into positions of power because then they're gonna open the doors and everything's gonna be great. And things have not changed significantly, like very significantly since um, I got my PhD in 1990. And um, I think I had this big realization that um, if people in power are kind of anxious about their position and they don't want to let other people, they don't want the power structure to change. So I, I guess I wanted to ask, and some of it you already answered, but if you could talk a little bit about kind of the power dynamics of breaking into an institution and, you know, making it more, I mean, science is suffering because they're the same voices that are talking all the time. And I know things are getting better, but I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, and you know, and actually, because of that, exactly what you described, that is a, that is a form of gatekeeping. Because it's like, you know what? We're the ones who are in. We're gonna control who else gets in. We're gonna control what papers get published and who gets the grants, which keeps them in control. So if you're the ones making those decisions and making sure that you don't broaden the circle of who gets in, it keeps that in place. So I do think, I talk about this concept of an outsider within because I do feel like some of us who are the outsiders need to get in. Many times what happens is we'll say, I don't even want that. It's, it's, it's the good old boys and I just, I just don't want that. I'm like, I'm sorry, some of us are gonna have to get in there whether we want it or not because you really can't change the system from the outside, you really can't. I used to say, I never wanna be an administrator. Never, like, like what do they do anyway? I used to say things like that. But then I actually started to learn, like wait a minute, someone's gotta run the institution and they're, you have to be in positions of authority to help affect the change. You have to understand the system that you're trying to change. So you need to get in it to do it. And I feel like more of us are just going to have to get in and open the doors. So you know what, I do things like, oh, you let me in, all right, now I'm putting my foot in that door and I'm going to keep it open a bit and I'm calling all my friends, like, come, the door's open, come in. And the other thing that I've done my whole career is as soon as I learn something, I'm going to share it. Because that was the, that's the other way that you keep it insular. Like, you don't tell the people who are on the outside like what goes on. You don't give them those little secrets. So I'm like, I'm going to share all the secrets because we need to do that for one another to affect the change. So I really think that Yes, it's true that things aren't moving the way they should be, but we need to just keep pushing the door, getting in. We need to share our stories. I, that's why I talk about the truth telling and, and say like this is how it really works. More and more of that is gonna force the issue. Because I, I thought the same thing as you. I thought they're gonna get out there and they're gonna open the doors for everybody else. Not necessarily. And then the other thing that happens is some who have been ostracized themselves, once they get in, they're like, oh, this is good. Like, <laughs> I'm in now. And they don't feel the need to help others get in. So I, I think it's a concerted effort. We can't let our guard down and like we're constantly at it. But I'm convinced that the more we change and disrupt the dynamic, 
that we are going to start to see some change and call it out when we see it. So the situations that you found yourself in have been the kind that deter many others. Um, uh, when people overlook the research that you're engaged in and don't ask you to participate in a grant opportunity that they're pursuing, mm -hmm. when you walk into rooms and find yourself not um, obviously similar to other people who are in the room, when um, you're faced with assertive questioning from someone who's irritated or annoyed at least or maybe outraged at, at worst, that your presence is causing them to rethink the ways in which they've interacted with people. So what has enabled you to, uh, to persist given all that? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I think about that a lot. Like sometimes I think that I decide to just not even think about it because if I thought about it too long, I would just give up like everybody else. So that's one part of it, just not overthinking it. But the other thing that I, I realize on reflection, that some of it is my personality. Like some of it is like, how dare you tell me I can't do that, I'll show you. Like that there's that piece of it. But also I learned, at, for on, again on reflection, that fairness, just fairness, just deep down fairness has been such an issue for me, even as a little kid. Like, even as a little kid, I would tackle any bully on the playground. They, I don't care if they were two times my size. Like, who, who made you in charge? Who said you could do that? I remember one case with um, my older sister. We were 18 months apart. My dad was in the military. We were always moving to different places. And someone picked on my older sister. I went and found her. And I'm like, how dare you? We are not going to have this. I, th this was, I, I, my, I was in second grade. My sister was in the fourth grade. I scared that fourth grader. She went to the office to say, to say that she was intimidated by me. And so when I got called to the office, I, I'm speaking to the principal, and, and he said, you know, like, what did you do? And I'm like, look at me. I was in second grade. Like, what could I have done to this big fourth grader? So I, I think there was something about just being driven by just downright fairness has helped me. And the, the last thing I'll say is, I really do think it's important for us to try to think about serving others. And that has helped me through my career. It's like, Gilda, it's not about you. This might help somebody else. And the idea of being able to help somebody else has helped be a driver. Because I felt, especially like I, the example I gave in grad school, I thought, okay, if I don't make it, they're never going to let another one in. Um, but just that kind of sense of responsibility and trying to make a difference. And I, I left you with this, this uh, quote about humor, because I also feel like we need to have some fun with the world and find some joy in it. I don't care what we're doing. Like, try to find the fun in it. And I'm finding fun. So, and I, being here with you all has definitely been fun. I've enjoyed every bit of it. Please join me in thanking Dr. Gilda Barabino. Thank you all.